Thank you for listening to the BJJ Brick Podcast. We'll be bringing you Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu and good times. We hope to flatten your Jiu-Jitsu learning curve, help you get the most out of your grappling ability, and meet your goals both on and off the mat. Welcome back to the BJJ Brick Podcast. This is episode 251. Today we have an interview with our friend Brian Freeman. My name is Byron Jabara. I'm here with the Cowboys of Grappling. I've got uh, Gary Hall and Joe Thomas. yippee ki <laughs> <laughs> Hey, that's my line. How you doing, Byron? <laughs> doing good. You guys are known yep. for being the Cowboys because when you uh, get back, back mount, you actually a lot of times will put spurs on your on your feet and really dig in, and it's it's, it's a nightmare. I thought you were calling us a cowboy because of the chaps Joe likes to wear. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm putting the no in no gi. <laughs> <laughs> he doesn't wear big, spats. No. Yeah. He doesn't wear spats. He wears chaps. Grappling chaps. We, we're on to something there, Gary. That's uh, There's definitely room to grow on that one. Yeah, literally. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> But this is a fun episode. A little different. You'll you'll notice the interview. Uh, you're, obviously, you're just listening on the podcast here. But the interview has a different feel to it. Uh, Brian's at my house, and uh, interviewing face to face is always uh, it's just different. It's uh, it's definitely better. But two weeks in a row. Two weeks in a row. Yeah, last week it was uh, we had all five people involved in the podcast around the table. That was really cool. Uh, and in this one, I purposely filmed it last week. You can check out last week on our YouTube channel and, and watch the whole episode. It was recorded from start to finish, and, and we put it up there on YouTube, and that's kind of neat. This one, the interview was recorded on video, and I was really purposeful about it. I, you know, we're facing the camera this time and, and, uh, and, and being mindful of that. And I also got an opportunity to grapple with Brian and uh, had our friend – Jeremy uh, do a little bit of video while we were rolling, and so I spliced in little segments of him rolling with me, and and uh, and then we go back to the interview. Although the interview just maintains over the course of us rolling, because you don't need to really hear us rolling. But anyway, if you're wanting to to get a little bit deeper on this episode, go to our YouTube channel. I'll put a link to it in the show notes, I guess, and uh, watch the video interview. It's a lot of fun. Byron, I hope you didn't just splice in uh, parts of the video where you guys were rolling where you were doing good because. Uh, Brian actually told me he kind of uh, cleaned up cleaned up the match with you there. The guy's got a, a really cool uh, technique for Kimura, and uh, we didn't can... get that on on video. Which you know, it's keep it a secret for the guy, I guess. But uh, he he his grip's a little different. Man, a lot of control, and I was really surprised. Like, man, I, well, I, the... that is one of the best Kimuras I've been in uh, that I could think of, and uh, yeah. you know, way well, better than Gary's. <laughs> <laughs> well, the crazy thing is, we went out to lunch and. Uh, we're actually practicing that Kimura grip at our table. Uh, I think our uh, waiter was a little afraid to come over, th- thinking we're a little crazy. Yeah, that was kind of cool. We all uh, I got a hold of Gary, and he, although he dodged Brian on the mat, he doesn't dodge Brian for lunch, and we all went out for lunch. <laughs> I never <laughs> dodge anybody for lunch. <laughs> uh, but that that was really cool. Speaking of cool, if you want to support this show, Definitely check out Byron's audiobook, uh, Your First Year BJJ. Uh, it's two and a half hours of content. It's only $11.99, and it is getting great reviews. Uh, one of the things that we really try to do is grow jujitsu, and jujitsu is hardest in your first year. And Byron walks you through everything you're going to have everything that's going to happen to you in your first year to make it a smoother transition. So you hit that second year running and uh, you'll be up to year 15, year 20, and you, you're staying on the mats. Uh, it's basically got everything in it. Uh, check out the link on the show notes, your first year in BJJ. Yeah, it's uh, a great guide in that very tough time. Uh, it could be a fun time, but it, like the ups and downs are, are high and low in your first year. And this guy kind of reminds me of our off the mat lesson. My brother does triathlons. He, you know, the type of triathlon. It's not like a full Nathan? Ironman. Yeah, Nathan. Uh, not a full Ironman or anything crazy like that. But, like, you know, it's a 400-meter swim. It's a 10-mile bike ride and a 5K. He's, he's gotten into this over the past year or so. And so he's really uh, wanting me to try these things. <laughs> and I, he, he, he recommended the idea that I split one with my wife. And you could do that, like, as a relay. So I'm going to swim. Then I'll past the little computer chip that monitors where you are to my wife and she'll bike the 10 miles i'll recover from drowning 
in that about an hour or so, and then I'll run 5K <laughs> is the plan. So I like to swim. Swimming is fun. You know, you get in the pool and I have a good time and I'm comfortable. But so I, I go to the, the lap pool at our YMCA. It's 25 meters across. I get in, I start swimming. And I'm doing the like a crawl stroke where your face is in the water, you're breathing out, you you pull to the side, and you and you take a, a breath in as you as your arm is up. You know what I'm talking about? The, the yeah, classic there. swimming stroke. And I can't make it 25 meters. I I have to stop treading water, gasping for air. Like I'm exhausted. I, I it's like this is super hard. I got to go 400 meters, and I literally can't swim across the pool. So I ended up that day deciding, well, I got to be able to swim 400 meters. So I did different strokes, you know, backstroke and did some uh, you know, doggy paddling and, and different side strokes. And, 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 I, and I could swim 400 meters with all these uh, strokes that aren't really designed to get you anywhere with any sort of speed or efficiency. But they keep my head above water uh, for the time. So I go and I talk to my brother about it and my dad, and, and they basically tell me, you don't use your legs much while you're swimming that particular stroke. And I couldn't believe it. Like, the, literally, the, like the biggest muscles in my body, I'm not going to use them to move myself. That sounds ridiculous. But they're also taking the most amount of oxygen. So I get in the water the next day, and I was able to swim 50 meters. Down, I, I swim down and then back without stopping uh, and, and without really running out of uh, air. And it was hard, and, and but I really concentrated on going a lot slower because, like an idiot, I took off as fast as I could swim, and of course I gassed out. <laughs> like you can't run a 5k as fast as you could run uh, at full speed. You have to kind of measure and, and get yourself down a little bit. So I, I was able to, to swim 50 meters, and really the legs you kick them enough to where the, your feet don't kind of drag down and cause a bunch of friction in the water. You want yourself yourself to be kind of uh, level with the water if you can but really trying to slow myself down and using my arms to propel myself to the water huge difference the next day i swim 150 meters this morning i swam uh 200 meters I, all, every day i'm swimming a total of 400 meters but i just do it at chunks today i swam two chunks of 200 meters uh when four times ago it's not four days but you know four times swimming i couldn't even swim 25 meters and really, it came down to using the wrong muscles to do the wrong thing at the wrong speed. And dragging that back onto the mat, it could be a lot of things as far as using the right muscles. You, you, could, you could kick your legs and swim, but that's not how most people do it. That's not an effective way to do it. You could, you could squeeze and clamp down with your uh, hip abductor muscles when you do a triangle, or you can get a better angle and you could press with your, with your big muscles in your legs. It's just, there's a lot of different ways to do things. And if you're getting exhausted, you might be doing them wrong. And that's kind of what I learned for swimming. And I did take kind of the learning approach. I've, you know, I've been fortunate to learn during the podcast. And just a lot of this is going to be technique. <laughs> I'm not in terrible shape. But if I focus on the technique, I should be able to swim 400 meters. And I keep having to tell myself, slow down. Don't get overexcited. You know? I don't want to be the, the, the new person doing jiu-jitsu who is working way too hard and not getting anything accomplished. And uh, that's... It's been a learning process. I've always thought myself being able to swim, most like, much like people think themselves being able to fight or being able to grapple. Once you get out there, it's tough. And uh, <laughs> I'm swimming a lot better now, and the race is in, uh, in about two weeks. And uh, hopefully I won't drown out there, guys. Floaties, Byron, my piece of advice. Make sure you wear floaties. I don't know it if that's... probably legal. is. <laughs> That's a, thanks, Gary, for your uh, uh, confidence. <laughs> hey, I'm just looking out for you. Yeah, that's what friends are for. Well, thanks. That's very kind. But really, just use the right muscles and focus on technique is what I've been doing, and it's been working great as far as learning to swim better. Yeah, slow slow down and put out uh, less effort. Seems counterintuitive, but sometimes that is uh, what it takes to loosen up and. Um, have enough energy to, to do the technique you're working on. Yeah. So we have a quote this week. We'll go ahead and play it. We recorded it at the BJJ Brick Summer Camp. Here it goes. Hey, man. Um, oh, the quote of the week is, strong people are hard to kill. 
Say that again. Strong people are hard to kill. That'll be a quote of the next week. That's right. Strong people are hard to kill, man. That's that's uh, that's my personal motto. Thanks to Kevin. Uh, strong people are hard to kill. So the whole the whole point of the quote, I don't think, is necessarily about being physically strong and and being hard to defeat. I think it has more to do with uh, character. And when you think about jujitsu. There's a ton of things trying to kill your jiu-jitsu journey. Just put it into it. You got family pressure sometimes, financial pressures, jobs, a discouragement from not uh, advancing like you think you should. All these things are trying to kill your jiu-jitsu. And, and it's the person with uh, a really strong um, core and, and they're fundamentally committed to moving forward. Those are the people that they're not going to be affected by all that other stuff. That's an interesting way to look at that. Uh, not just literally kill something, you know, not get killed, but just the, the support network and, and keeping your jujitsu alive. Yeah, I like what Joe was talking about, the, the core, you know, the, the fundamental there, uh, you know, to keep it going. But, you know, coming from Kevin, uh, strong people are hard to kill. I kind of take it a little different way. Uh, if you've met Kevin, you realize Kevin's a, a trainer, a uh, trainer. The guy's 59 years old and just in insane shape. I'm thinking of uh, more like uh, Kevin, you know, has a healthy lifestyle. He spends his time in the weight room. He spends his time in the boxing ring. He spends his time, you know, raising his son. He spends his time on the jiu-jitsu mat. He is strong physically, mentally. That physically strength is keeping him alive. Kind of like what you're talking about, Byron, uh, about the spoon kills more people than... I forgot what else it was. More people are killed by the spoon than the knife. Yeah. And, you know, he's keeping his body, you know, physically strong, flexible, um, you know, and it's hard to kill that person per se. You know, we're not necessarily talking about murdering somebody. You know, we're talking about uh, that's a healthy person. That person's uh, going to be strong in life. Hey, my friends, this is Byron coming at you from the audio editing room. Uh, Just want to get you up to speed of what's happening on the show real quick. We are doing another prank on Gary. If you're new to the show, occasionally we'll prank Gary. Sometimes we do it for several episodes in a row, and I'm able to get on here and explain the prank before it happens because Gary didn't actually listen to the show once it comes out. So uh, this this prank series uh, will be... We'll quote Gary from a previous week. Like last week, Gary, you said it. there's more than one way to skin a cat. And then we'll talk about it and then see how he reacts. Although Gary said nothing of the sort last week. And that's kind of the prank. We'll kind of you know put some words in his mouth and, and see if he spits them out or just goes along with it because he's a nice guy. And uh, that's the prank. Uh, these pranks typically last four or five episodes and either they fall apart because uh, what we're claiming is pretty outrageous or we just want to end the prank at some point, and uh, we'll see how it goes. We've done this several times to different topics, but the uh, the current prank is Gary. Last time you said this, and it really made me think about this or whatever. So I'm getting ready to say that to Gary. Just want to let you know that this will be happening several times uh, over the past several episodes, and uh, we'll enjoy uh, having some fun at Gary's expense. So I'll get you back to the regularly rolling episode, and here we go murdering somebody you know we're talking about uh that's a healthy person that person's uh uh gonna be strong in life yeah that reminds me of last week gary you're talking about um taking care of yourself and and you know as far as, as I drinking hurt. as you heard <laughs> no but like off the mat you know like you don't you don't eat super unhealthy you don't drink soda and and uh <laughs> That's, that's just been one, one way that you've made yourself stronger. And uh, literally, you should be more resistant to diseases and other bad things that will actually take you out uh, by treating yourself properly. I mean, it goes back to what you talking about last week, Gary. Yeah. Well, you know, Gary right? always says, health. That's one <laughs> of the things he loves about jujitsu. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that is true. Health is one of the best things about jujitsu. <laughs> So I want to thank Kevin for the quote and thank both Kevin, senior and junior, for driving the long drive, making it to the summer camp uh, this year. It was great to meet them and to spend time with them on the mats. And, and uh, man, I hope they had a great time. I know we did. Now we'll forward roll on to the interview with Brian Freeman. I like, I like that, Byron, forward roll. <laughs> um, 
Hey, I just want to, uh, is this our third time of having Brian on the show? Yeah, I believe so. And I think that's the first person we've had on three times. Am I correct on that? I don't know. Um, if so, Brian deserves to be in the BJJ Brick Hall of Fame. Oh, he absolutely is. He, so yeah. I, I yeah. talked about that early on the interview. Uh, he was one of the first people that I saw online. This guy looks pretty interesting. Like He's really doing something that's inspiring, and I'm impressed by him. Send him an email. Hey, do you want a, or a tweet or a Facebook message? Whatever. I don't know how. I contact him, and he's like, sure, I'll do an interview. Like That was cool because it was outside my circle of jujitsu. It was somebody I had never met before. And it was super easy to to work with Brian. I think that that was a, a very positive thing for the podcast to experience early on in the show. Yeah. But didn't it, uh, didn't Roy help you out getting yeah. in touch with him? Yeah, yeah, because Roy, we've had Roy March on twice. Roy is uh, his coach there, and uh, we had Roy on, and he told us about or about Brian and and Byron had uh, seen Brian before and uh, definitely wanted to get on him and uh, get him on the show and. You know, then the crazy thing is uh, we actually get to meet Brian, so uh, that even makes it even better. Actually, I think Brian's episode was before Roy's. Oh, was it? Yeah, because he's talked so highly of Roy that we said, oh, we better get him on the show. Oh, so it was the other way around. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Roy is okay. episode 16. Brian is episode... No, Roy is 17. Brian is episode 16. So a little okay. bit of BJJ Brick history for you guys. Yep. Back to back on those guys. <laughs> Literally, Joe. Literally. <laughs> Little introduction to Brian. I don't think we've uh, mentioned that yet this episode. He has a T4 spinal cord injury. Uh, he's uh, basically paralyzed. His legs are basically paralyzed. He's been grappling. He's a purple belt now. And uh, he's an adaptive athlete. So he's, he's having to actually uh, come up with what techniques work for him. He likes to grapple uh, able-bodied uh, competitors and other adaptive athletes. He really is motivating for people who are in similar situations as him and, and uh, get to work with him and experience jiu-jitsu with him. So I uh, highly recommend Brian. You know, if, if you're an adaptive athlete or considering becoming one that does jiu-jitsu, get a hold of Brian. Super nice guy. Send him a text or send him a Facebook message or tweet, and uh, he'll be happy to help you. That's the type of guy he is, and that's what we have on the show so much. He's really cool. Yeah, there's all kinds of people out there with uh, physical limitations, whether they've got CP or uh, amputation or uh, injury like Brian has, who could benefit from physical activity. And jiu-jitsu really can be for everybody. So if you're listening and you know somebody like that, make sure you share this episode with them. Well said, Joe. Here goes Brian. He is the most interesting grappler in the world. Working with a group of scientists, I attempted to train a group of leeches to drain cauliflower ear. This project ultimately failed because all things I train end up giving cauliflower ear, not taking it away. As a teenager, I got fired from my pizza delivery job because I kept offering free pizzas if you could tap me out. Nobody ever tapped me out, but I got many complaints about not following IBJJF rules. I had to get congressional approval before entering a tournament. I don't always listen to podcasts, but when I do, I prefer the BJJ Brick Podcast. Stay sweaty, my friends. I want to welcome Brian Freeman back to the BJJ Brick Podcast. Brian, welcome back to the show. I'm happy to have you here again. And I look back on the history of the podcast and a few people like yourself have really helped me get this thing started and off to a strong start. Realizing that I could see somebody in the jiu-jitsu world and send them a message. And sometimes they say, okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you were yeah. one of those guys. Like I interviewed some, a lot of friends, a lot of people that, that I knew through jiu-jitsu, a lot of friends, friends, that type of thing. But it wasn't very long after that. I ran out of people to talk to that I didn't already know. I'm like, look at this guy, Brian. This is this is pretty cool what he's doing. I sent you an email, and you were super cool. I'm like, yeah, let's do it. Right. Oh, this is easy. <laughs> so, <laughs> it, I don't know how many uh, negative experiences of people saying no it would have taken because I've gotten a lot of those back to back to back. Like I could send out right. a whole bunch. And, and, like the whole weekend, I just strike out. If that happened first, I don't, I don't know if I, this would have been uh, 
I would have had the energy to keep going, but he was so cool about it. I think that just getting that idea of I could reach out to people who are doing cool things in the sport, and it, and a lot of them say yes. You got your podcast so, confidence. I did, <laughs> and uh, I think he helped a lot with that. I remember the person who gave me my jujitsu confidence. It was before I learned a guard pass or anything, and I went to like a seminar, <clears throat> and it was the the last station was an advanced uh, guard pass to a submission, and uh, black belt C.J. Murdoch, he. I was watching this, and they were starting on one side and jumping across the person to the other side, and it was, I didn't have the mobility that I have now, and I was like, there's no way I can do that, and he was like, no, you're going to do it, you know, we're going to get you through it, and I got through it, and I was like, okay, so if I can do that, I can, I can pretty much do anything in the sport, you know, so, uh, yeah, it's, it's cool to get that confidence <laughs> early on. And that was at a seminar? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, they would. So you didn't? Did you not know that person very well? That was no. I didn't. You. I had not even learned a guard pass yet. They was like, "What's your guard pass?" I'm like, "I don't have one. <laughs> I haven't learned one yet." I'm, I think a lot of people don't have a guard pass. They just want to get past the legs. Right, right, you know, right. Like, that's kind of cool. Uh, but you know, welcome to Wichita, and and this has been a, a cool opportunity. He's spent the morning here. We went to open mat together. Got yeah. some good mat time, and. Uh, had some had some good times on the mats, and, yeah. and I I was pretty aware of a lot of his game as far as uh, wrist locks and, and sometimes giving up uh, some position and be, and working from those spots and uh, being aware of it doesn't really help a ton. <laughs> it helps, I think. Like I think with wrist locks, if if somebody is totally clueless, you get a surprise one on them pretty good, and it's like whoa, and then the next one will be a little bit tougher, right? Because right. they didn't even think it was going to happen. And when you get somebody who's good at wrist locks, and you know that at a time, it really helps. But uh, I don't know. Talking about your game, I your your north south was was very interesting, and, and like he got top north south, and I compare it with anybody in our gym as far as like I feel like I'm just gonna get choked. Like, Thank you. Trying to like get space, fighting for air, trying to get my arms between us. Uh, that that was that was a tough spot. Very interesting Kamora game. He showed me some tricks. <laughs> <clears throat> well, you know, training with Roy, he's so detail oriented, and for me, I find that I need all the little details because I, where you might use your legs to to incorporate in part of like maybe your Kamora trap or or just anything. I don't have any of that, so yeah. it's as many little details as I can get. The better it is for me, you know, especially trying to understand the things that I can't do. It's like, I can't do this, so I need a detail or I need a, a mechanic in this move to make up for that deficit. And so, yeah, I, I think that's where some people think it's tricky, but um, maybe it is. I have some trickiness, you know, especially from the uh, traditional bad spots. Yeah. but uh, Maybe crafty <clears throat> is another word you could use. Yeah, yeah. Like, I, <clears throat> so I, I, at the point I got on your back, we rolled for, I don't know, was it 45 minutes, an hour? Yeah. You know, like, we recorded a little bit of it, so we'll play some of that, too. But um, several times, I get in your back, and I know this is a spot that you work from. And super hard to get to your neck. <laughs> <laughs> like, uh, and just throwing up, you know, like, wrist locks and making me reset my attack. It seemed like uh, it was a charm. We also have a little cat here that's just stopping by. In here. <laughs> Cats but have the best it was like swords. I would I'd start to set up my choke and then I would defend uh, an attack on one of my arms and I'd start to set up a, you know controlling it and I have to defend again and then before I know it I was like I was really trying to move to an arm part because I wasn't <laughs> super comfortable like this is a spot I should be perfectly happy at and it, it was disrupted right and so I think that I mean anybody that is used to if you pick a spot and just work it that could be anything right and and that's something that I think you've done with certain positions because it's you know somebody's going to be happy to take your back if it's presented yes and, and I catch a lot of stuff in those transitions because their muscle memory is immediately seat belt hooks get control and then start working and I'm aware of that you know right off the bat so while muscle memory's taking over I'm looking you know Thorn's usually going to come over this side. Everybody usually reaches over and under, so it's yeah. You guys are predictable. Eventually, I, I started putting both arms on. I'm like, well, I'm not going to choke anybody with both arms underneath. Uh, but uh, yeah, that was, and my hooks were largely ineffective anyway. Like, 
Well, see, I want to be there, and so your hooks are keeping me there. So yeah. I'm basically using your legs to my advantage. I'm not yeah. using my. That's, that's some real black belt magic right there. <coughs> I just have your legs do what mine won't do. <laughs> <laughs> so all choked up. Uh, yeah. So now you're purple belt. I think you were you white belt when I interviewed you first. Yeah. yeah. Pretty early on. Yep. What has that been like getting? going up to the ranks a little bit and dealing with the belts because I know that each belt represents something different for people what have you experienced as a blue belt what have you experienced as a purple belt that's been different um blue belt was a hard transition because I went from getting tapped out by all these white belts and I get my blue belt and the very next day I was still getting submitted by you know the white belts that were tapping me out and uh it took a little while to feel like a blue belt because the day after I got my blue belt, I still just felt the day before, like I did the day before that. But it was, um, it gave me a lot of confidence. Like, okay, I can definitely, if I can get a blue belt, then I can, I can get a purple belt. And if I can do that, I can eventually get a black belt. And so when I, every step that I could see, I could accomplish or achieve everything that the able bodies in the sport could do was just something else that cemented the fact that I'm doing jiu-jitsu for life. I'm not stopping. This is something I will do forever. And um, so that was kind of part of my blue belt journey. Um, also, I was able to, um, you know, nobody really wants to listen to the white belt. <laughs> Shut up, white belt. <laughs> you know, so getting the blue belt helped a little bit. And not that I want anyone to listen to me, but, you know, for a long time, there were just a few of us adaptive athletes. Like, I knew, like, two or three guys, and they didn't know anyone. So, as new people started getting into the sport, uh, you know, like, newer white belts or whatever, who who maybe had some sort of handicap, uh, paralyzed like, like myself or, or whatever, they would reach out to me for help. And so, going to their gyms to help as a blue belt made me look at least like I'd knew a little bit about what I was doing and especially for my situation and um then once I got up to purple belt the purple belt level um I so so Roy promotes through a curriculum you test and everything and obviously there is no handicap curriculum so part of my purple belt test was writing my own curriculum I had to uh, he put me through it (laughs) but it really helped me understand my game and now that I'm at purple belt um I feel a lot more confident to go out and help new athletes because what most people don't think about, I believe, is when uh, someone with a handicap rolls in a gym, they they see able bodies doing this and they're wondering how am I gonna, how am I going to do this? But most people don't think about the coaches who are like, oh, I've only ever taught able bodies. How am I going to teach this guy? So being at Purple Belt has helped me to feel a little more confident in. Not just helping the athletes, but helping their coaches as well. So I think that's been the biggest transition. Going from someone who is not sure if I can do jiu-jitsu <clears throat> to saying, oh, I can do jiu-jitsu, to someone, oh, I can help others like me doing jiu-jitsu. Now I can help others and their coaches. And I think all that just helps more of us get on the mat, you know. <clears throat> yeah, that's an interesting uh, concept as far as, the coach has to be able to teach it, mm-hmm. and it's easy to pick up, here's how arm bar works, here's how the scar pass works, <clears throat> but you have to change some things for people, and that's right. sometimes hard for people to do. So you have to look at, what are we trying to do? We're trying to pass the guard. What are we trying to do? We're trying to escape from a bad position, or we're trying to work from that, or right. like just kind of change some of the parameters <clears throat> and get good results in that process. Right. And it's not all the same. <laughs> and a lot of it has been uh, just instead of looking at a set of techniques, just looking at the concept behind all those techniques. What are all these different arm bars trying to accomplish? They're trying to straighten your arm out, <laughs> you know, yeah. hyperextend it. There are intricacies that, you know, keep you from moving so you can't escape that. So yeah. instead of grab here, grab here, do this, do this, do this, it's control this, control this, stop this, and then go there. So it's it goes from this grip doesn't work to this grip doesn't work to just approaching it from the standpoint of, okay, I have to do these things. How can my body allow me to do these things? So it's just been a whole 
different way of approaching the techniques. It's, it's more approaching concepts than techniques. It's, it's kind of where I feel like I'm at these days. And I feel like when I go to help other people who are in this situation, yeah. that's, that's where we go every time. We, we just break it to a concept because not all of us have the same mobility. Yeah. I feel like I'm fairly mobile. Um, even though I don't use my legs, I've learned how to move a little bit like an able body and have somewhat of an able body game. Uh, my friend Max, he, he has no core at all. So he goes to his back and just plays flat on his back the entire time. So his game is really unique. It's no traditional techniques there at all. It's just 100% concepts, and um, I feel like that's the whole driving thing of, in a way, I feel like we're doing jujitsu that hasn't been done. We're finding things that hasn't been done, so in in some ways, I feel like we're revolutionizing techniques a little bit, because I feel like if I can do this stuff, if you can do it and then incorporate your legs, there's going to be even more, you know, so it's... I feel like in a way we're kind of evolving the techniques, you know, kind of under the radar. Yeah. You know, and not many people want to stay mounted, but we have lots of techniques. I feel very comfortable when I'm mounted. I can tell. Yeah, you know. So. <laughs> hey, you get him out, and he's cool and collected. He's working different things. I think you wrap my lapel around yeah. behind me. I'm like, okay, that's different, and I'm trying to figure out what's going on. Like, really... <clears throat> I try when I roll a lot of times, especially people I don't haven't rolled with before. Part of it is keep this guy from putting me where I'm confused. Right. And a lot of times I was confused. <laughs> like, that's just the way it was. Like you had, I didn't feel like like you had a position you got to several times where you were kind of at my back, but you're more across my shoulders. Mm-hmm. Uh, maybe you controlled one of my lapels. Under your lapel, yeah. yeah. Like, that was an awkward position. And I'm like, I don't know the proper way to turn out of this. I need to figure out which grip is more important to deal with. Uh, it's good. It's good for me to deal with confusion and see see what I can do to it. But it's great for you to put somebody else in a state of like, this is unusual for me. Right. Because usually, if someone's confused, that person's usually in more trouble than they realize. <laughs> right. Exactly. Exactly. And you know, like uh, I call that my mount guard. What I did to you. Okay. The lapel behind and here, and. You know, for one, I'm holding you in place so you yeah. can't come up to a high mount. You, uh, so I, I have you pretty much just stuck in, in place. I'm grabbing your lapel so I can protect my neck and keep myself glued to you. So this hand is doing nothing but protecting my neck and keeping you close. So it's it's um, understanding like all the things you can do to me when you're mounted. You know, I don't want a high mount. I'm supposed to keep my elbows down so you can't get a high mount on me. But if I stay here, I'm never going to move. So. I have to figure out another way to keep you from getting that high mount, keep you from being able to posture up and create that space. And so, that's just a, that was that's probably one of the best examples of yeah. like applying the concept of shutting everything down that you can do, and then whether you dismount either way or I can create a sweep. But you know, I got control ready no matter yeah. where you go. You mentioned that when you first started jujitsu, it felt like there were very few adaptive athletes out there. Yeah. Do you think that was the actual case, or do you think that there were some out there that were just fairly quiet and kept to themselves? Or yeah, there were definitely some out there um, who were training, who were you know blue belts, and um, right now the the highest ranking guy we have is uh, Spina Bifida, and um, he's a brown belt. I do know of a couple of blind black belts um, here in America, but Brazil is way ahead. Yeah. Brazil has some some paraplegic black belts and. Um, the UAE JJF has done a lot to uh, uh, add para brackets, and I think Brazil has like two, over two hundred guys on their roster. And um, in America, there are like five of us guys, you know, in wheelchairs. There's more and more, and I know there, there's probably some new guys that I'm not even aware of yet. Yeah. But yeah, there were guys. Um, there was a couple guys with cerebral palsy in Canada. Who were training and not really out there, and um, another guy, Shannon Kitchen, who's been on yeah, the show. Yeah, sure. Shannon, you know he's blind, so he doesn't do a lot of social media, so it's kind of hard for him to, to be out there. But you know, with with us being so small and jujitsu being such a small community in itself, it, it we just started finding each other. Yeah. And I mean, even now, you know, as far as um, 
we have uh, quite a few amputees in the sport. Yeah. But as far as like uh, the guys who use wheelchairs and and everything, we still haven't really grown that much. There's less than ten of us. But you know, I remember when I only knew of two of us. So <laughs> the <clears throat> it's nice with social media. It could be a small group, but you could be you not know, feel isolated and feel like your your struggles are unique to you. You know what I mean? Like yeah. It could be the same thing with like, like a women's class. You could be the only girl in your class. You could you, you could have rolled for two or three years and never met another woman that has done jujitsu. I mean, right. that, I talk to girls that have that experience, but they get the the shared experience through social media. Like right. Other women are doing this, and w- today I had this problem on the mat. What was that like for you? Like I think that that's really a, a big help in getting people to not feel like. What they're doing is like clearly there are no other girls here doing this. Like why am I doing this? Like <laughs> there are no other adaptive athletes in in the city I'm in, let alone at the gym I'm at. You know, right? Like, but yeah, go online and you'll find them. And I think that's been been a great way that you've helped encourage people to get on their mats and. Yeah, um, you know, for a long time I thought the the best way for me to help other people in my situation find jujitsu was. To do as much as I could, like in competitions against able body athletes, just to get that attention. And um, now that it's kind of um, picked up a little bit, it's been a lot easier to find other ways to get. We, um, my friend Max and I, just did the first um, abilities expo for for disabled people up in New York, yeah. and so it was a whole event for people who knew nothing about jujitsu, you know, and some of them were a little freaked out seeing us choke each other because they had no idea what it was about. But, um, but at that event we had, um, a little, I can't remember if it was four or five year old boy who got on the mat with us and tried some stuff and a little girl. And then we met another guy, Steve, who was, uh, he had spinal bifid all his life. He went to different karate schools and they all told him no. He lives in New York. He rolls past Henzo's Academy all the time, and he never went in because he knew they would say no. We got him on the mat, showed him some chokes. He went to Henzo's, signed up, and he's been doing two classes three times a week. Man. So it's um, now we're trying to find other avenues to get more of us on the mat. And um, it's... So I, why, what was your logic between I want to grapple able-bodied people in competition and promote what you're doing like did that how'd you come to that idea so initially my first competition i just it was kind of like um kind of like a role like i don't think i can do jujitsu my daughter says you can try okay well i can at least try i tried okay i I can do jujitsu next thing you know i'm you know i'm in classes and i'm like i can really do this maybe i can compete you know and i'll go do that too and and so it was more of a what can I do? Yeah. Then once I established that, like my first couple of competitions, I just got swamped by people wanting to take pictures or ask me questions or whatever. And I'm like, you know, I'm hoping because I'm totally, I'm not a, an attention seeker. This is totally not in my personality. If, if you look at my social media, you see jujitsu and stuff, but you don't see like all the nerdy stuff I like to do behind the scenes. You know, I'm like a space geek and, I like all that stuff, but so I had to kind of put some of that stuff aside and was like, okay, I get a lot of attention from doing this. Hopefully somebody in this crowd will say, you know what? I know a guy down the street who came back from Iraq and, you know, he's a paralyzed or missing a leg. Or I know a kid down the street who's grown up with cerebral palsy who's always looking for something. So I was hoping that someone would go back and say hey you know i saw this guy in your situation or something similar to you and he's doing jujitsu maybe you should come try it you know and that was my approach for a long time was just hoping that i would get enough attention that someone who knew someone who this would help you know would see me and say ah i need to invite that guy to jujitsu yeah so that was my whole logic just um I tell people I, I never try to get attention for myself. I'm trying to get attention for what I what I'm doing, so other people can come to it also. Because it's just helped my life immensely. My mobility, my health. I've lost uh, I think about 40 pounds since I started, and um, I'm just healthy now. Yeah. Yeah, I feel better. Yeah, you, yeah, you roll. You didn't seem to get tired at all. Yeah, I just yeah. I don't know how we roll, but it seems you roll with several people at the open yeah. mat and. I remember when it, I was thinking I was 
like fighting, you know, for yeah. like ten minutes, and it was like three minutes in, and, <laughs> and then I realized one day I'm like, you know, if I get attacked in the street, all I have to do is survive for about a minute and a half or two minutes, and that person's gonna start gasping for air, and <laughs> yeah, it's definitely uh, yeah, come a long way, yeah, and it's been all jujitsu and what it's done for me. So. You do other things besides jiu-jitsu as far as fitness. Mm-hmm. Yep. I'm a, I do endurance events, like uh, marathons in my wheelchair and also hand cycling. And um, that all spawned from jiu-jitsu. Did it really? Yeah. Jiu-jitsu was first and then... Yeah, because what happened was after my very first tournament, I realized real quick that I did not have the stamina that... The able bodies had. I think everybody feels that after the first turn. Right, right. <laughs> well, see, I right, chalked it up. To, I chalked it up to they can go jogging, and I can't. Like, yeah. I need okay. some cardio in my life, yeah. and um, so that got me in the cardio, and I, I kind of got addicted. I like the runners high. I like doing the really long distance. Long stuff. distance. Yeah. So We're that also. A bit, you said you do several half marathons a week. Yeah. Yeah. About twelve ish, twelve thirteen miles. You get out there. And yeah, that's in my in my wheelchair on my hand cycle. I'll. I don't know, 20 miles or so, just for workout. Um, so how many times a week are you on the mat? Uh, typically, as long as my life's not too yeah. crazy. Yeah, uh, does that three, four times a week, three, okay. maybe three nights a week, and then an open mat. So uh, a good bit. I do, basically, I can, I'll can. i go out and do like a, I don't know, half marathon in the morning and then jiu-jitsu at night. <laughs> <laughs> then get up the next morning and cycle 20 miles. and Yeah. I don't Staying know. active, that's for yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. I feel younger than ever. Yeah. I feel like I'm getting younger. Solid jiu-jitsu <laughs> keeps me uh, going. But but it gives me the, I don't know, like maybe something's wrong with my head, but <laughs> I just had the thought like uh, a few months ago, I was like, you know, I think this year I want to do like a 100-mile race. Like I don't know why, but it's like jiu-jitsu gives me confidence that when these ideas pop in my head, it's it used to be like, Man, I wonder what it'd be like to do a hundred mile race. And now it's like, I think I'm gonna do a hundred mile race. It's like I'm You're all the thoughts where I wonder. Yeah, it's like it, it went from I wonder to like I'm gonna go do that. And you know, like if you think about when we were kids, when you saw somebody doing something cool, you didn't care if you could do it or not. You wanted a turn. Yeah, you know, you'd go out and fail miserably, but you got your turn. You know, and sometimes you'd even want to go again. So. It's like now I don't care if I fail or or not. I just want my turn, you know, yeah. and have some fun. And if I make it, I make it. If I don't, I don't. And so sometimes you're do a hundred mile race, one hundred six miles in Arizona. Yeah. Why is it one hundred six? I don't know. Maybe it's just the course played out like that. Okay. So yeah. Arizona sounds hot. It's in November. Okay, that helps. So hopefully, <laughs> but okay. So this is another thing. I just posted on my social media the other day. Part of this is I. I I can handle the heat pretty good, but I have this other thing in my head where I hear people say, oh, I didn't get to do my cardio today. I, I couldn't get out there before it got too hot or, yeah. you know, whatever. So I want to, like, okay, that's when nobody wants to do it, so that's when I want to go do it. So I can get on social media and call everybody out for being complainers or yeah. or whatever, you know? Like, is it that bad? Like, uh, are you trying to make exercise? <laughs> like, it's supposed to be a workout. Are you trying to make it as easy as possible? Yeah. So push I, yourself a little bit. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. So, I, I, I don't know if... Yeah, I, I guess I'm a little bit crazy that way, and then jiu-jitsu gives me the confidence to... Cool. The endurance training, I think I could feel that on the mat as far as your hand strength and your arm strength. It's not like... I mean, it's clear like, like your grip. You're holding on. Okay, I, I try to address the grip not going to break the grip but you're also not holding on that hard like it didn't feel like you were squeezing me like like uh, super hard you were holding on hard but it wasn't to your limits of it was just like I don't know it, it was it was more than enough but it wasn't excessive and it was at a relaxed right. grip for you mm-hmm. like if I was squeezed that hard it, it wouldn't be a relaxed grip and I couldn't do it for very long Right. <laughs> I do, my hands naturally want to close, and I guess it's just from pushing so much. Yeah. And even when I'm not pushing, a lot of times my hands are still here, so my fingers don't bend back. Like, my hands are yeah. not very flexible. They just are naturally here. And, you know, I've found, not just for myself, but all of us adaptive athletes have unique abilities 
that able bodies don't have with our body. Even though you can use your whole body, and, and I can't, I have like that endurance in my hands and arms, and it's a different strength, I yeah. think. Um, uh, Jess Munter, who was here, yeah. because she only has one arm, her um, that she can use, her, her legs have more dexterity than a normal person. And usually when you're in those situations, it's freaky because, like, like you know, like, I can't break the script. What do I, now how do I address I can't address yeah. it, you know? So. Well, I mean, I, I roll people whose grip I can't break, but I look at them and they're 240 pounds. Right. And it's like, okay, I can't break his grip. But it's like, I can't, I didn't break the grip. <laughs> Dang, I should have been, you know, like, it's just... Uh, you know, it does catch you off guard. And the same, like, you roll with somebody who's really flexible and have, like, a lot of dexterity, but you can kind of see it coming a little bit, but it hits you with a bit of a surprise. I I, I remember uh, listening, I think, to an interview by a guy who does uh, free climbing, rock climbing. Mm-hmm. I think his name's Alex Honnold. And so that's climbing, no ropes, no safety gear, a bad height that will kill you mm-hmm. easily. And he, he was talking about his hands and, and the, like... It's not a workout for him. He he gets he, he grabs the rock, and like these muscles are so used to doing that, it's literally like not even. It's more like a cable that is latched onto something than yeah. than a muscle thing. And I felt like that like like you grab my my gi, and it wasn't like you were were needing to like squeeze. It was just like a it, yeah, it was like automatic grip. It was like man, he's not letting go of that unless <laughs> he's done with it. It like, feels like walking, like. Uh... Uh, a good example is I, when I push, say, 26 miles in my wheelchair, okay. my arms I, don't stop. I don't take breaks. Okay. They just go. And it's For just 26 like. 26 miles. Yeah. And it's just like I don't have to think about. I don't think about the pushing. So when it comes to, like, grips or, or any kind of strength like that, um, I don't think about it, you know. To yeah. me, it's not. I don't even think my my hand or my arm's going to get tired. It's just no, it doesn't. Yeah, it's just like I just do it, you know, and I don't think about it. And um, I know, I know, I've incorporated in um, a little bit of uh, rest time to give my arms a little, yeah. my hands or my grip a little break. But I really find that I don't need to that much. Just um, it's almost like I've evolved a new type of arm <laughs> a new type of hand or something so with, with so you're kind of given or or you've developed some physical attributes that you didn't have and then on top of that you developed a game that is unique to you i mm-hmm. mean and i think those are, are two things you can put together and yeah and it's an interesting combination yeah so adaptive athletes where do you see this like five ten years from now as far as you and then as far as a community of, of where you hope it is um i would say for me for sure um i want to continue to compete um i compete personal reasons just um it's fun you yeah. know um it's a little more of a challenge than just even going to a different open mat and rolling with people you don't know um I'll probably always do an occasional able body tournament because, you know, the the main focus I had when I started was being able to defend myself. Yeah. You know, especially being a single parent, a little kid, and um, I wanted to travel with her and you know feel safe. So, for me, doing um, like an able body points tournament that has that encourages that fast pace yeah. because the points and time limits. <clears throat> to me, I feel like that's almost like as close as I can get to a real street situation with a fully able bodied person attacking me you know so when I do those tournaments that tournament in those type tournaments in particular I have a little different mindset it's not so much of a competition it's uh let me survive this and let me see how well I can do surviving yeah. it and let me be aware of even though we're only grappling and my opponent is you know only grappling let me be aware of where I could be hit where I could you know where it could go wrong and um it's kind of. I have this uh, fear that if I, of just getting attacked in the street and like completely failing with jujitsu, and then I'd have to go home and throw away every medal <laughs> that I won in a competition. That you know, it's just kind of like, because what are they worth then? It's like, yeah. Um, but I, so I'll always compete, but um, I just see it growing more and more, and I, I feel like 
four years ago, I was a novelty. People treated me like I was a novelty. You know, like, wow, there's a dude in a wheelchair doing jiu-jitsu. And now, with more and more people on the mat, <clears throat> it's becoming more normal, you know? Oh, that's just the adapted division or yeah. whatever, you know? And um, I, <clears throat> I had a friend, Rafa Diaz, came up from Puerto Rico recently, and he's a white belt, and he's been without power for like six months because of the hurricane, yeah. living on rainwater, but training every chance he gets. <clears throat> so I had a, he lived with me for a few months, and so he was, I guess, kind of like my first student, you yeah. know, the first person I was able to, to spend a lot of time with and work with from the ground up, and that was really rewarding, and I would like to, to definitely do more of that. And then he went up and did a tournament in New York, uh, the Grappler's Heart Tournament, and won a match with a Kimura that I taught him when somebody's mounted on you. And so <clears throat> I, I think that that was so much better and more rewarding than any submission I've hit in competition. You know, it's like, wow, you know, I, I taught him that. That was cool, yeah. you know. So I think also, you know, as time goes on, I would like to um, to help out the newer Absolutely. generation of adaptive athletes. And, and I, I definitely see, like, Roy. Roy is not – his focus is, hasn't been I want to be a world champion. His focus is I want to be a world champion coach not coach world champions but i want to be like the best coach or teacher i can be yeah and i definitely see the rewards in that after yeah. this so but then again i, I don't ever want to stop competing <laughs> man i went the, the year i did the pans in 2014 or whatever it was uh i i was done and we were there watching the black belts the next day and there was like i don't know master six or whatever the highest yeah. is. there were two guys out there that were probably in their 60s or 70s and and they slap bump and they went after it and I was like I want to do this <laughs> I want to do this when I'm old like those guys <laughs> so <clears throat> yeah I, I see it being bigger I see it being more um, not accepted because it's already accepted we're not projected yeah just more normal just more part of it um, I think it, we have a, an ability to maybe evolve some techniques um be cool one day to see some able-bodied guy say huh you mounted me okay i'm gonna fight from here and choke you from from here you know it, it, we well, see uh, each you, other we, we always when i teach mount escapes <clears throat> i think you gotta oftentimes you'll have to try two different escapes at the same time like i'm gonna try to roll the person if i can't roll the person i shrimp and get my guard back <laughs> if i just try to roll the person they get blocked that if i just try to shrimp, shrimp and get my guard back they get blocked that but doing two it makes it much tougher. Doing two and possibly threatening something else it, it's another thing to throw in the mix to, to make them to deal with that. It, it, it might, you know, you might get, maybe you could try to, to roll somebody and end up locking a Kimura in, or maybe you could try to fake a Kimura and, and, and escape from the mount or something like that. I mean, right, exactly. And, and, and the way that you move, it, it's different than because everybody else is training mount to escape. Right. And you're training mount and Although you're you're doing things that are different, you're not leaving yourself open. Like, right, right. I think somebody's gonna come over from the mount. Yeah, I'll armbar that easy. Like, no, not really. Like, <laughs> you're addressing the the factors that the person will like lead into it because nobody tries to come over at me from mount. You know, like, right. So you know, I get mount. I'm not worried about that. Well, maybe I I should. It's nice to see something like that come from a different angle. And the other guy's talking about. I'm kind of confused. Like, okay, right. I don't know if, if I actually need to proceed or if I need to stop and rewind and try to take back what he just took. <laughs> right, right, exactly. It's kind of an interesting dynamic. And, and, and any time you could, even when somebody's in mount, if you can make them a little confused. So, I, good. so what I suggest to people to do is sit down and think of all the positions. Mount's the best one. What, do you, what, what techniques do you have when you're mounted? Do you have escapes? Do you have any attacks? Do you have any... Sweeps per se, yeah. yeah, reversal. Um, most people have escapes, so yeah. when you go to those positions, uh, mount's the best one. I'm like, go there and do not let yourself try to escape. Stay there, you know. Do it for a week. Just slap, bump, fall back, mount me. Now, now choke me, and uh, you'll start seeing. You know, it's just like anything else. You'll start seeing, um, especially because everybody knows. Fairly the same jujitsu. The mount, you know, they're going to go for a choke or an arm lock. You know, it's usually going to in the gi. You know, they start setting up cross collar chokes or a traditional arm bar, so it's predictable. Yeah. So just uh, yeah, all those positions where you, you teach people to escape, put yourself there and not don't allow yourself to escape. Don't have that be the yeah, and just uh, yeah, deal and with it from the position it is. Because 
I know so many able-bodied people, and it's happened to me too, where you get in a tournament and somebody gets mount, and a lot of times their whole focus is staying there. And when somebody's committed to staying there, not opening up yeah. to attack or anything, you know, you, it's essentially like saying, okay, I can't escape, so what yeah. else can I do from here? You yeah. know, and, um, and, and that, that also plays into some of my game. The mental part of it is if I, I let you throw your best stuff at me, and then I'm still there. Yeah. Then you're like, oh, what am I going to do? <laughs> do? Try that arm bar I learned last week or whatever. So I think yeah. people want to escape so bad. They don't want their coach to see this. You know, I'm a purple belt. I got a white belt mounted on me. I, I can't let my coach see this or or whatever, you know. But stay there. You know, it, it might be the difference in you getting out of that guy at a tournament who's just riding the clock out yeah. to win or it might be, you know, you might get attacked by some right. giant in the street, you know, yeah. where, because it's not always, you know, especially if somebody else knows jujitsu, yeah. you know, it, you can't always escape, you know, and it's better than happen. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it be, in, it's kind of, it be uncomfortable in a, be comfortable in an uncomfortable spot. Yes. And, yes. And, uh, a lot of jujitsu ends up being like that. Yeah. And I find if I can go to the worst spots just right off the bat, and just say, all right, what you got? Okay, now <laughs> that was it. <laughs> that's it. You know, yeah. All right, well, you can't you can't submit me here, so you're definitely not gonna get me here or here. So, yeah. So, Brian, one more thing, uh, a, a big thing that I want to talk to you about is somebody wants to try this. They've never done jujitsu. They're wanting to be an adaptive athlete. I don't know, if wheelchair, or maybe they're uh, missing a limb or something. My advice would be to find a, a good gym, yep. train a couple months, and then go train with Brian, <laughs> and and, and they kind of use him as a coach. But really, what advice do you have for them for just starting jujitsu as an adaptive athlete? First, I would say, and I, I tell this to everybody, regardless, um, when you get there to your first class, it's not going to be what you expect. You know, I think so many people are worried that. You know they're gonna suck because I hear you, you hear that mostly. Oh, I suck. You know I suck. I suck. We all did at first, but I tell people it's not gonna be what you think it is because when you go, they're gonna want you to come back. Yeah, they're gonna be helpful. They're gonna be welcoming. They're not gonna smash you. They're gonna you're gonna leave there saying, "Wow, I want to go back." And um, so I would say for most people, just just go, just be relaxed, just go, just go and um, be open about what your limitations are. Um, I, you know, some people probably maybe have that ego. You know, it, it gets choked out of you through your jiu-jitsu journey, but at first it's there, and maybe somebody's like, uh, you know, I, I don't want to lose, or I don't want to see people, you know, people see me suck, or, or whatever, but just go and have fun. Yeah. I think the have fun part is the best thing. And um, it may not matter to some people, but for me... Being able, especially the the first few months, just being able to be, I'm, I wasn't in my wheelchair, I was, I couldn't stand up, but I was sitting on the mat, and so was everyone else. You yeah. know, it was like, you know, if someone walked in and looked, I was just like you know, everybody else. You yeah, know? And, and not that I care about being like everybody else, but you know, after you spend some time in a wheelchair or uh, you know with a disability or whatever. A lot of times you feel like the people you can relate to are others with disabilities, and it feels like a disconnect between the able-bodied life you used to live. And so it's still kind of it's kind of a place where you can kind of feel it all. And uh, so yeah, I, I would so and and I guess to tie all this stuff together, I would say to all those people, don't go in with expectations. Just go have fun. Yeah. Don't worry about what you can't do or or anything because able bodies walking into their first class. They're just as clueless as someone in a wheelchair, Absolutely. you know. So, um, yeah, I'll just say focus on having fun. Would you recommend doing like uh, private lessons or something first like that, <clears throat> or just go on? I would say it depends. Um, yeah. I would say you know if you're very mobile um, and you don't have any, I would say like health concerns. Yeah, I'd say you know just jump right on. in there. You know if if, if uh, but. You know, like like for myself, my mobility is really limited. 
and my, I could tell, you know, Roy was like, I'm not sure what to do with this guy. So it was really good to have those privates for a while where it was not just one-on-one learning, but it was also one-on-one learning for the coach Both to ways. say, exactly, yeah. to say, so your coach doesn't say, oh, you can do this, you know, here, let me show you, <laughs> and then, oh, you can't do it, okay. Yeah. And then he's, you know, because he shows up to class, and he's like, all right, tonight I'm going to teach this armbar series. And he gets there, and then there's there's me, and I can't do that armbar series. If he knows me well enough, then he he's already sees me and says, okay, I know your mobility. Come here, let me show you a derivative of this, or you know something different, you know. Yeah. And, it, and it really helps speed up the the learning cool. process. Yeah. Yeah. So I think part of it is, like you mentioned earlier, getting the coach to understand how to teach yes. differently, and. There are a lot of gyms out there where coach has a purple belt, yeah. coach has a brown belt, and that's perfectly fine. I mean, yeah. there are a lot of great gyms and great schools, and people have good times and get good jujitsu. But it it takes a, a bit of creativity and a bit of like really good knowledge about jujitsu to be able to change it and have it still work. Yeah, and have an open mind yeah. about things. I have people see techniques I do. I've had have people come in and say, "I see a high mount and arm bars and collar chokes," and I'm like, "Well." Everybody says that until they roll with me. Yeah. You know, I, I mean, I'm aware of, my coach was aware of all those things when he taught me yeah. how to deal with all this stuff. So, um, yeah, the, the open mind is a, is a big thing. Yeah. And, um, the, uh, the only other, I would say the biggest issue with, with certain people, I would, I wouldn't even say coaches in general, but is when they want to try to really force a technique. Yeah. Like, you know, you can really do this. Like, no, I can't. Yeah. You know, I hear people, uh, you know, switch your hips. Hips don't switch. They don't, I can't move them, you know. And, yeah. Um, and to me, it's like in their brain, they just don't want to say, okay, he, he can't do that. He does have to do this weird unorthodox stuff. And if I could get them to just stop trying to force me to do things that my body physically won't do, and yeah. get them to open their mind. So I, I really think just having the open mind is a, is a big thing as far as coaching us goes. Yeah, and part of that probably is dealing with some of the frustrations of <laughs> somebody tell you to do something that you're not going to be able to do. Right. It's like, especially when you're you black belt. At night, it doesn't feel that good. Like, I couldn't do it, you know? Right. Like, yeah, exactly. So. And, 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 you know, say you're black belt, been training for 15 years, you've been hearing for 15 years you have to escape when you're mounted yeah you know you can't stay there you gotta you gotta get out of there it's not a good spot and like my friend max what's how is he gonna escape he can't upa he can't he can't even really play a top game very much because his his, when he comes up on top his legs stay there so you know how are you gonna no you you've got to figure out a way to get out of mount you know it just doesn't work that way so yeah the um, the open mindedness is a is a big thing as far as coaches go and it, to help us and I guarantee you somebody like that will be the hardest person in the room to submit from out <laughs> yes <laughs> like, yes yeah that, for that's sure that's just the reality of it and like even getting that on you is like it was hard to really hard to start an attack getting on your yeah. back it was hard to start an attack yeah it's like you spent more hours in those positions than I have. Right. I've been on I've been on the mat much longer, but it's like you've you've trained in those a ton and, and very deliberately. Like right. I train there, I typically like, okay, get out this method. It worked or didn't work, you know? You're trained there, okay, how do I how do I perform in this position? Right. And and get it to work for me. And I think that's been been it's been cool watching you. I think this is your third time on the show. I know at least we've had you on yeah. before. And uh, you've recommended some people we've had on the show, and that's been awesome. And uh, I think you are like a, uh, uh, like a, a pillar of adapted athletes in jiu-jitsu. Thank and, you. Uh, I really appreciate you doing what you do and, and uh, helping people out because uh, jiu-jitsu is life-changing for anybody who gets addicted yeah. to it. It's, it's a big deal. Yeah. And, and I think you've seen that result in you as well. Yeah, for sure, for sure. You know, when I first started... I could get out of my chair. I could have my legs in front of me, and I could scoot myself around on my butt. And now I hop around on my knees, and I do flips out of my chair. And <laughs> it's just all stuff I've learned in jujitsu. You know, and it's, you know, technique works uh, to help your body move, yeah. just like it helps for me to move your body or whatever. So, yeah, jujitsu, man, it's like uh, 
sinless. Yeah. You think that uh, you're using muscles you would have never used and then thus being able to move in ways you never could have. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. For sure. That's awesome. Man. This right. has been awesome. Thanks for coming to Wichita, buddy. Yeah, man. <laughs> Thanks for having me again. This is definitely the best jiu-jitsu podcast. <laughs> Thanks, man. You guys and, uh, do the best interviews. Y'all have some fun. And I love it. Thanks for stopping by. Brian if, Freeman. Yeah. If anyone if anyone has an adaptive athlete, um, yes. I travel a lot. I'd love to come out and help. I have um, like a motivational and education, educational seminar that I yeah. do. It's, it's not like I'm going to come in and make you a world champion. I want to come in, motivate you, inspire you put you in my situation a little bit and just maybe change your perspective on things and i've gotten a lot of positive um feedback from from when i've done it so yeah. um that's something else i like to do and just anything i can do to you know help further adaptive athletes jujitsu able body athletes whatever you know it's What's the best way to get a hold of you uh instagram wheelchair jitsu twitter wheelchair jitsu um Facebook Brian Freeman, but there's like a million Brian Freemans. I'm, I'll put the right one on the link. There's only one choking Hicks and Gracie in his profile profile picture, though. So that's me. But yeah, oh, that's awesome. Man, it's a pleasure. Hopefully, see you again in Wichita. Yes, for sure. Later on this summer or next sometime soon. For sure. Thanks All for right. having me, Brian. I really yeah. appreciate it. Man, I want to thank Brian uh, for making the stop in Wichita. He is driving across country and. Uh, he got a hold of us. Hey, I'm coming through Kansas. Where in Kansas are you guys? And uh, we ended up being able to connect, maybe get some mat time, get some lunch with Gary, and record a interview, even a video interview. So, uh, man, good times. And uh, just kind of uh, interesting to see that the interview, that the first interview I did with him was back February 3rd, 2014. Uh, times have changed. Brian's still a great guy. And just kind of a dream come true to, to meet somebody like that and to have him just come right through the, the city that we live in. And, and uh, man, really cool opportunity. And uh, thanks so much, Brian, for stopping by. We've got an article this week. Uh, it is on this really interesting website called bjjbrick.com. It was originally written as uh, a text message uh, to me. I don't know what text message, a Facebook message, I think, maybe an email. And uh, Joe, not our, not this current Joe, uh, but another guy named Joe wrote it, wrote this, and said, "Hey, I just want you to know that how important how important Muay Thai is uh, for my uh, BJJ." And I was like, "Man, you can make this an article, you know." So he took it back and he kind of rearranged the things a little bit. He sent it back to me, and I said, "I'm putting it on the website if that's cool with you." So it's up on our website, Muay Thai for BJJ, and I think we've all experienced. You know, one physical thing Brian talked about doing um, races and and marathons and how that's helped him with jujitsu and probably vice versa. Uh, and and Joe Joe really wants to talk about how Muay Thai is helping him for uh, jujitsu. Yeah, very interesting article. Um, you know, G- Gary had the wrong idea when he saw this. He thought every now and then he lands a, an accidental elbow or knee when he's rolling. And if he does Muay Thai for a few months, those accidental knees and elbows will be much more effective. Joe, Isn't that right, Gary? <laughs> Joe, those weren't accidental. Ah, see, I, I, yeah. <laughs> I knew there was some power behind him. <laughs> the follow through is really you notice. Yeah, I actually really like the article. Um, the author spent a pretty good deal of time talking about uh, distance management, and and I really do think that's an area where most uh, jiu-jitsu practitioners could improve. One of the things about training Muay Thai, when you get to the point where uh, you start sparring, if you're lazy and you're at the wrong range for the wrong amount of time, you're going to pay a high price. And on the jiu-jitsu match, usually if I get in the wrong range, you know, I get double legged maybe or, or tripped or something. It's not nearly the same price you're paying. And I wanted to go to the ground anyway. So uh, so having that uh, system in place, I don't think I learned to manage distance the way I would if I had in the back of my mind that I'm going to get punched or kicked if I don't do this right. Yeah. And then after, you know, talking about uh, distance management, I love it how he goes right into angles and how that is so important with both jujitsu and Muay Thai. Uh, you know, he's he's not wanting to fight somebody straight up. He's trying to get angles. And, 
you know, he talks about a, a wrestler proved that to him uh, by getting a takedown, you know, at an angle and how much easier it was. So uh, not only were you worried about distance management, you know, being in the uh, you're either not close enough to strike, you're in striking range, you're close enough to grab your opponent. But uh, we also want to, you know, be stronger than our opponent. We want to get an angle where the angle is beneficial to us. And uh, that's another way, uh, you know, movie tie and jujitsu crossover. Yeah. Another thing that I was just thinking about as, as I was reading the article again, uh, it depends on why you're doing jujitsu. I know for myself, the biggest reason is because I enjoy it. It's, it's a lot of fun, and, and I feel like uh, a lot of that joy comes from the actual, you know, doing jujitsu. Some of that joy comes from feeling like I'm getting slightly better at something as I progress and and uh, try to learn new things. But if, if one of the main reasons why you're doing uh, jujitsu is for self-defense, spending like a night a month or maybe a couple of nights a month doing a little bit, bit of Muay Thai can greatly supplement your ability to defend yourself. Absolutely. That's a great point, Byron. And you don't have to, you know, fall in love with it like we all have with jujitsu, <laughs> but you know, just you know, throw a good combination, you know, and 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 work that range. Figure out, you know, how far somebody is, uh, you know, b- being able to uh, look at somebody across from you and say, I bet you this guy could jab me if I stand right here, but probably not from if I stand over here. And it's the same thing as jujitsu. If you don't train it, it's really not a fair competition. If you know, once you get someone on the ground that's brand new. It's not a it's not a fair fight anymore if they don't train. It's same thing with with the stand up game. If they don't train, it's a different game. And like I don't train, and I I know that somebody who has trained Muay Thai for a month or two would would have a good time picking me apart <laughs> if I were to put the gloves on and try to do Muay Thai. I I don't train. I don't find that enjoyable. But um, if if self defense is a big reason, that would be a great uh, thing to throw in and just to supplement your training with as well. You know, one thing I think of, you know, uh, Joe here is talking about the the different benefits, you know, being more flexible and, uh, you know, dealing with range management and uh, angles. You know, I wonder, you know, if somebody could ever come up with a study um, of it just seems like, you know, you were talking about once a month, but maybe even trying to move a tie once or twice a week. Yeah, you know, would definitely help you on the mat. You know, I think it would allow different parts of your body to heal. It would allow you to maybe get more flexible. Your mind still thinking in the same, you know, set of, you know, distance management of angles, stuff like that. And, you know, sometimes just having a a break of doing something different, I I think uh, could definitely help you. You know, that's, I I don't train Muay Thai. I'm a 100% jiu-jitsu guy, but I've thought about it numerous times. Uh, I haven't done it but uh i do think uh it would definitely help me you know something about muay thai that's uh maybe unique to joe is that he loves it and if uh if you want to get these benefits from another physical activity outside of jiu-jitsu it'll help if you're passionate about it so it might be muay thai for this guy for another guy it might be wrestling classes or it might be a day a week for doing crossfit or yep. something that you're passionate toward for training for a tough mudder competition or something i get the impression that part of the benefit here is that joe loves muay thai yeah that's a good point uh joe joe <laughs> we got too many joes here uh, definitely a good point yeah it's you want to do something you love you don't want to just you know drag yourself in there and you're not having fun with it and and byron mentioned it before you know he, uh, he loves jujitsu and uh it's something he really likes and uh you know i know byron uh plays racquetball and stuff like that and uh you know, I know Joe likes to uh, put on Joe, not the author Joe, our Joe, Joe Thomas, likes to put on pink dresses and prance around. And so, <laughs> you know, I know there's a, a lot of stuff, you know, that you'd be passionate that will definitely help you out. Yeah, it's it's my it's my uh, little hobby horse competitions I go to every week. <laughs> like I said, he's a cowboy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, but I want to thank him for the article. Uh, yet again, different Joe. But uh, Joe check, Marquez, thank yeah. you, Joe. Check it out. There'll be a link in the show notes. It's on our website, and uh, you know, I encourage any of you guys who, if you have, if there's a, a topic about jujitsu that you are passionate about, whether it's you found a new way to train, or your coach told you this and it changed your whole perspective, or I don't know what it is, something about it that you, man, this would really help people. Type it up. Email at bjjbrick at gmail dot com. I'll check it out. More likely, we'll uh, we'll be able to put it up and share it with everybody else. So. Uh, yeah, thanks a lot, Joe. Want to mention our newest Patreon supporter, Dane, uh, in Australia. Man, 
Dane is one of the first to get the new uh, Patreon support pack here, Gary. <laughs> <laughs> Dane, Dane, I'm sorry. They did that as a joke, joke about me, as they're always messing with me. And I apologize of what they're sending you. So if you don't know what we're talking about, check out, um, I need to put it online, but I did put some on the video episode from last week. I briefly pop up the pictures when you're signing them of, of what you're actually signing. Uh, <laughs> Gary's got some autographed pictures that are really nice. And uh, so what is Patreon? You might be saying, what are these guys talking about? Patreon's a website for people who produce content like podcasts or music or videos. And if you want to support those people, like supporting us, you go to the, to the link on the show notes and you you sign up for Patreon. And the most common thing people sign up is they, they donate a dollar per episode. And uh, if you do that, we'll make it out a 5-inch BJJ Brick Gee Patch, a BJJ Brick sticker. You are invited to join our private Facebook group. But uh, to do that, I can't just go over find people because there's, there's like 300 million people on Facebook or if not more. So... Uh, send me a message on Facebook. My name is Byron Shabara. I'm the only one. And say, hey, I just joined Patreon. Would you please add me to the Facebook group? And I will do that immediately uh, or as soon as I get my phone in my hand. And now the newest thing. So I'm throwing all this stuff in the mail to you other than the, the, the Facebook group because that doesn't come in the mail. But the sticker and the patch go in the mail is an autographed picture of Gary. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Byron, I personally think that's going to hurt. You know, once people get this and you're talking about it, I don't think anybody's going to sign up for it. So here's what we're going to do. Once you get the autographed picture of Gary, take a selfie with it, and then send it to our Facebook page. The the uh, Send us a message on there, and, and Gary will get to see it. So then it. I've been around the world. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, in all reality, all I've ever been to is Tijuana, <laughs> Niagara Falls, and Montreal. So now I get to go other places. <laughs> Uh, Gary, once, I don't, I don't, Gary, I don't think our Patreon support is going to diminish. I just think the demographics of the people supporting us is going to change a little bit. <laughs> I think you're right, Joe. Yep, that's true. But uh, yeah, it's a new thing, and uh, it's just a, a prank that we pulled on Gary during the live episode that will live on for a while, as he is a good sport and will sign these pictures for us. He signed a few. But Gary, I, I actually get, signed some. I got to yeah. sign a few more. The funny okay. thing is, with the first ones he signed, I, when I design these pictures, I you know it's one picture, and then there's two Garys on there. There's a little space in between from the sign it. He signs them on the back. It's like, oh, <laughs> Gary, oh, was I supposed to sign them there? I sign don't know. Sign on the front because these Nobody are going to be has framed. Ever asked me to sign anything. These are going to be framed, Gary. So oh, sorry. Yeah. So uh, I've never. Yeah, I'm not that popular. <laughs> I don't know where to sign stuff. Dane gets one of the original where the signature's on the on the back, which is really kind of so. Interesting. Dane gets the uh, the very first one. Yep. Dane got the first one there. Also, I just want to give a shout out to Adam and Ryan, uh, our two more patron supporters that have been patron supporters for quite a while. So thanks, guys, for the support. This is the part of the show uh, Gary and Joe love the most when they get to talk about their own audiobook they've been working on, uh, The Cowboys of Jiu-Jitsu. And man, it's just amazing that nobody has made a book like this yet, but you guys put the saddles on, got the chaps on, and, and really got to this book and, and really did a great job with it. Uh, audiobook for the Cowboys that like to grapple. I mean, I don't know really how big the market is, but I think you you pretty much pinpointed something that maybe a person will buy here or there well we're not just looking for cowboys that like to grapple we're looking to convert <laughs> people that already grapple so part of this book is uh we're talking about the benefits of being a cowboy and being a grappler and we have a series of chapters on the various articles of clothing and tools that a cowboy would carry and how they can help you with their jujitsu. For instance, uh, one of the chapters I wrote was on using spurs when you get your hooks in yeah. to maintain the hooks. And Gary wrote one on uh, five different benefits of wearing chaps on the mat. So, Gary, tell us about that one. <laughs> well, first of all, I mean, you're not going to sweat through that chat. So, I mean, your legs aren't going to be sweaty. Um, it's a lot easier to hold back control that way. Uh, so, uh, that was a big thing. But that wasn't my favorite chapter. I, you know, we're talking about clothing items. You know, Joe really likes to use the spurs. You know, he can dig in. Plus, he can submit people with it. But I, I like one that, you know, belt buckles. You know, the bigger the belt buckle, the better. And, you know, just going through Tim Sled's seminar, 
we talk about a, a pressure. And one good thing about that belt buckle is once I get up towards your head, and I start crossing that center line, that belt buckle is going to turn your head to make you weak. Uh, so that's one thing I, I use it for uh, to my advantage. I mean, I've also taken off a couple of years with it. But, you know, that's one thing we're going to talk about. But my favorite, and I did not even know about this, Joe showed it to me, is how to avoid takedowns using the two-step. Joe, can you talk <laughs> about that? Well, Gary, it's all about the footwork, and uh, <laughs> you, you get the right tune playing in your head, and you just you're worried about what you're doing and not what your opponent's doing. And I would say it's effective like 11 percent of the time. So it's it's some it's not your go-to defense, but it's something to keep on it's the back burner. Definitely better than 10 percent, Joe. Yep. Yeah. A, a good half of the book is on one particular sweep, and it makes sense that the John, the John Wayne, Wayne sweep, sweep. Yeah, it is just. Yeah overwhelming in this book yeah but we don't want to talk about you know real jiu-jitsu moves you know <laughs> okay. a lot of the cowboys don't know that so uh you know another thing too is uh when you can't get somebody to train with you you know let's say you're the the smelly guy or the guy with uh, skin problems or um you know the big guy that is rough the way you get people to train with you is you rope them you know we practice that we rope the guy and we bring him to us so um, you're always going to have training partners. You're always going to be in good shape. That's another one of the chapters. Yeah. Definitely well, very beneficial. Well, you know, I, I don't get to roll much gi with Gary. I roll a lot of no gi. But rolling with Joe with the gi on, he actually managed to tie my feet and not hands together with his belt. Really yeah, kind of cool. People, yeah, people and wonder it, why I have to wrap my belt around my waist four times and it's still hanging down to my knees each time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think that thing works as a lasso and for hog tie-in for sure. Yeah. And the good thing is we do have, you know, we talk about the BJJ app. If you check out the BJJ Extra after dark, you will see what happened to uh, Byron after he was uh, tied up and hog tied. <laughs> oh, man. Yeah. Uh, you know, Joe, just in passing, mentioned lasso, you know, getting the lasso while you're playing guard. And that's uh, another yeah. cowboy style of technique. I was I changed the topic from what happened to me that night. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but definitely check it out. Um, it doesn't make it's a great gift not just for cowboys uh, you know I think about everybody likes it and it's a it's a good audio book to listen to around the campfire wouldn't you agree Joe? I, I would agree yep yep uh, a little bacon a little beans and a little audio book definitely yep. the bacon and beans you know you know Gary's top control is, is really good and and uh, you know he, when you turtle he, he still maintains good pressure and, and he's, he's able to ride for a little while uh, you know, he's not real actually big on being a cowboy. Occasionally he'll ride one, though. Uh, what, do we, <laughs> what do we have next week? Or what do we have next episode? Not even next week. No, later this week. Stay tuned for the BJJ Brick Extra episode. We've got uh, Seth Daniels. He's the CEO for Fight to Win Pro Promotions. Uh, he's also a black belt in judo and jiu-jitsu and uh, an insightful guy. So stay tuned and uh, check us out next week. Yeah, <laughs> he likes to ride cowboys. <laughs> <laughs> no, I quickly changed the topic so you couldn't uh, <laughs> recover. Uh. <laughs> All right, guys, uh, it's been a that's been a great episode, man. I really enjoyed uh, meeting Brian and, and also enjoyed sharing that experience with you guys uh, with the video interview and a little bit of mat time we recorded. Uh, man, stays, it's great. You know, I'm keeping this cowboy themed. Stay dusty, my friends. And don't forget to eat beans and bacon. Train hard, train on the trail, and uh, get better. Nicely <laughs> <laughs> <I see> done. <laughs> we all threw something in there. <laughs> uh, that was good. Yeah, I didn't have to make mine up on the spot. You guys did really nice. So, yeah, I figured, I was like, how's Joe going to make one up? That one's yeah, tough. Train on the that trail. That tough, but- thank you for listening I hope you find the time today to roll after all the best way to get better at Brazilian Jiu Jitsu is to do Brazilian Jiu Jitsu